Okay, in this series of videos, we're gonna talk about stock valuation. So what exactly is valuation? What does it mean? The market price is what you have to pay to buy things. Stock valuation implies an individual's assessment of what the price should be. Of course, once you compare what you think it should be to what it is, that sets up a decision. So stock valuation is an attempt to resolve the question of whether or not a stock is either over or undervalued. We're going to develop several different concepts as we go through this uh, these videos. So we're going to develop a, 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 a process, if you will, of identifying variables and then using those variables to quantify what we think the stock should actually be worth. So valuation essentially is based on the future, right? So for stock valuation, obviously the future means more than the past. Although the past can give us some information, right? Uh, all of the uh, investment literature that you might get about a stock or a mutual fund a mutual fund, <clears throat> excuse me, all say, you know, that the past does not guarantee the future, right? But we will look at the past to try to figure out maybe some trends or some directions that a company may be working towards. But we want to think about measuring performance. So there's three steps we're going to work through here in this initial model, if you will. We need to forecast future sales and profits. We need to forecast earnings per share and then dividends. And then from all of this information, we need to forecast future stock price. So let's start with talking about sales, right? So how can you predict sales? Well, there's two ways. A naive approach is just to assume sales are gonna grow as they have in the past and extend this historical trend. Now, that's obviously naive for a reason. What we want to do, and what we probably should think more about, is taking these, this historical information and then adjusting it for information that we've learned in the meantime. Right? So don't rely totally on historical information. To forecast net profits, we need to utilize a financial statement called a common size income statement. Essentially, it divides every item in the income statement by sales. So this is gonna help us identify trends, averages. It will give us a, a, a picture of where the company has come from historically. Now this is just a one year common size income statement. If we're thinking about looking historically, we may want to look at several years. What direction are these numbers moving in? But in general, if you think, if you take net sales and divide it by net sales, it's 100%. In this case, cost of goods sold, this company spends about 58 cents out of every dollar that it comes in, goes towards cost of goods sold in producing the product. At the bottom line, which is where we're talking about calculating net profit margin, this company has earnings of about 7.2%, which is of every dollar that comes in the door, 7.2% goes to the bottom line or to earnings per share. <clears throat> so if we're given a forecast, right? Let's figure out how we can estimate, right? So the future after tax earnings of the company will ultimately be then the estimated sales times this net profit margin. So if uh, last year's sales were uh, 1.93, uh, 1,938 million, right? The revenue growth is expected to be about 4%. That is a prediction. Where did we get that? Well, maybe we got it from 
uh, historical data, the average. Maybe we adjusted historical for some reason. The company seems to have a net profit margin of around 7.2%. So next year's earnings, you take the 1.938, multiply that by 1.04, 1 plus the growth rate, multiply it by the net profit margin, and next year's net profit margin is estimated to be 145.12 million. So if we think about how this process is working, now we have an estimate of what we think the net profit in dollars is. We certainly have the estimate of what it is in percents. So now we have to figure out of these earnings, how much of this ultimately goes to dividends, how much of it is retained. So we need to project the company's recent experience with respect to dividend payout ratios. What has the average been? Of course, we need to know what the number of common shares will be in the future. Now, this doesn't change much from one year to the next, but companies do from ten, time to ten, time buy back shares, and from time to time they will be issuing shares. So if, if we think that there's any chance of those changes occurring and that they are uh, substantial, we may want to incorporate that, that into our predictions. The other thing we need is to have some type of a estimation of what we think the P-E ratio will be in the future. Now this is much more difficult for us to estimate, however, this information is readily available at Yahoo Finance under the analyst section where they will provide us what's referred to as the forward P.E. ratio. It's a prediction of the P.E. ratio. So again, what's involved in this P.E. ratio, right? Growth rate, states of the market, right? Uh, the, the capital structure of the company, information about inflation, the dividends, right? So higher P.E. ratios are associated with higher rates of growth and earnings. It's an optimistic outlook, right? Typically, these companies may have lower debt levels, not necessarily, but it could be a characteristic. If inflation is a problem, that could be putting downward pressure on stock prices and, of course, P.E. multipliers. So most companies, this is a general statement obviously, with high P.E. ratios have low dividend payouts due to the prospect of earnings growth. And again, there's lots of reasons for why the P.E. ratio changes. Um, personally, I think a lot of the emphasis on the P.E. ratio should be more on how investors view Right? What are they willing to pay for the company rather than it's an outcome that comes from management's decisions? But again, we think about P.E. ratio, we need to understand how this all fits together, if you will. So let's think about what we might refer to as a relative P.E. ratio, right? So what does our company's P.E. ratio look like compared to the stock market's P.E. ratio, right? So the stock market's P.E. ratio is going to give us a general state of the market, right? It's going to tell us how aggressive the market is in general, right? A higher P.E. ratio is more optimistic for the market, right? But Increases in the P.E. ratio do not necessarily indicate a bull market, right? It is just an indication in general of how the investing public feels about the future. So if you look at the average P.E. ratio of the S&P 500, you can see that in 2003, there was a huge spike in the average. 2009, there was a huge spike in the average. I would say that the purpose or the reason for a lot of that might have been lower earnings, not necessarily higher prices. 
So if we want to calculate the relative P-E ratio, you would just take the company's P-E ratio and divide it by the S&P 500's P-E ratio. So if our company's P-E ratio was 35, the S&P 500 is 25, then we would have a relative P-E ratio of 1.4. What this would tell us, again, just as a picture, right, is so that this stock will probably be higher priced in the market than other stocks. It appears that investors prefer it to the stock market on average. Now again, it could also mean lots of price volatility, right? We, we understand over time, the PE ratio again is a picture of investor optimism, right? Sometimes, very frequently, investors could be wrong. So how can we forecast dividends and prices? So we need to have a picture of the company's future P.E. ratio. Maybe we get this from, uh, you know, the existing P.E. multiplier, and then we adjust it up or down based on expectations. There are, as I mentioned earlier, there are publications that can help us decide and figure out what the future P.E. ratio should be. So once we understand what this P.E. ratio should be, we can now start working our way to solve for the value of the stock. So again, estimated earnings per share is just the estimated net income divided by outstanding shares. Now just as a general vision, if you will, right? Can we break this down into some parts, right? So if you take the net income divided by the book value of equity, right? And if you multiply that by the book value of equity divided by the shares outstanding, again, since the book value, since these divide out, we end up with this formula above. But what this allows us to do is to divide it into two parts, right? Earnings per share is a function of the return on equity of the company, profits that are earned based on investor uh, shareholder investment. Book value per share is the accounting value of the company. So again, if we want to increase earnings per share, we either increase book value per share or we can increase return on equity. But this is a place where we ultimately can use some fundamental analysis, some things that we've learned about the company to plug in this number again to forecast uh, where we think the company is going to go uh, in the future. So that's the end of this video. We're going to continue on with this model and then to get into some very specific stock valuation models uh, in, in continuing videos.